Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Unfiltered Experience, where we have candid conversations and unfiltered ways to be able to maximize what it is that you walk away with to per to personally improve your life. I am Christopher Roush, and this is the beautiful Mr. Scott Goyette. How are you yes, doing, sir. Scott? Uh, I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing interesting. I'm doing interesting. You're That's doing my word of the day. Yes. You're doing interesting. Uh huh. That's what so I'm explain doing. to me what interesting is. I'm, I'm, I've been on a explain me what this word means kind of kick lately, as you know. So, uh, what is interesting? Interesting. Well, think about this. When people take interest in you, then there's something special about you. There's something that makes people gravitate to you. And that's really been the word of the week for me is interesting because um, the person that we're going to share and talk about today was the most interesting man in the world. So, um, yeah, yeah, a lot of stuff to talk about today. So. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm looking forward to it. It's been, uh, like you said, it's been a crazy week considering the fact that you and I got to meet each other this last Saturday. It's already been almost a week ago that we got a chance to meet each other in person and hang out for a couple of days, which was a lot of fun. Beautiful. Great to meet you in person and finding out you're not a dick in person. You're actually really nice in person. You're the same, <laughs> you're the same person you are out here, yeah, you know, yeah, 3,500 yeah. miles away. So that was an awesome experience. And we got a chance to talk. And I just and eat more in real life. That's the only difference. I yeah. just <laughs> eat a lot more in real life. I just keep eating because I like eating. So. Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't even say about the rest of that stuff, but good evening, Susan. Great, great to see you. Great to see you. Um, yeah, and you know what? Honestly, in preparation for the show and the conversations that we've had and reviewing the materials, you know, it's obviously the impact of what Max has had in this legacy and the lifetime that he's left. And I'm just I'm just really eager to learn more about the man and the legacy that he left because I think a lot of us can learn from what people leave behind. And I know that's one of the points of the show, Scott, is to, to exemplify his legacy and what he meant to you guys and your family to be able to share that story out to people and be able to, to leave you guys, the listeners, with the fact of, you know, we only have so many moments in this life. And Scott, and I talk about it all the time and the breaths that we take and the things that we focus on. The point of the show tonight is really to bring you into our family, bring you into Scott's family, bring you into the total unfiltered family and just let you share in the fact of this is what we do when somebody that we love dear to us goes and goes to the next journey, if you will. This is how we celebrate and we maximize their life, if you will. So, uh, Scott, I'll defer the mic to you, man. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that we talk about in our coaching, Chris, and um, I think it's day one of our coaching is we talk about writing a eulogy for yourself, which is a, a really weird thing to do. And part of it, and one thing I always like to explain to people is we're individual perspective points of source itself. Some people might call source universe. Some people might call source God, creator. And we're individual perspective points, also known as paintbrushes. And this canvas of life is a place that we can create moments, we can create meaning, and we can create everything. And the ability to do that does not end the minute we put down that paintbrush in this world. In fact, it just begins because everything that we leave, everything that we leave just keeps going. And, um, and it can be really beautiful. And so some of the things that I want people to take away today as we're talking is when we're thinking about Max Friedman, the most interesting man in the world, I think it's going to be important for us to think, what did he leave? What did he represent? Was he somebody who was a good listener? Was he somebody who was patient? Was he somebody who was funny? Was he somebody who inspired others? Was he somebody who motivated others? And let's take those verbs, those, those beautiful verbs, and let's take those beautiful adjectives and let's immortalize those today and remember who he was and take those parts of him and make them become one with us starting right now and living on for eternity in us, our children, and everybody from now until the end of time. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, Scott. It's very beautiful. And for you guys, our Unfiltered Crew family, uh, Lynn, I see you in the house. We love you guys as well. This is an opportunity for you to share in our in our process, in in the in the in the process of this memorial and this legacy building uh, show that we're doing right here. So be, please feel free to comment there, share your share your personal stories, perhaps, or things that you that you would be like to be remembered for. This is a conversation that we want to have with you, but mostly just to to, to share what the life of Max's um, legacy is. So we have a lot of uh, interesting stories and people that are going to be coming on and sharing that with us and there's going to be a lot of emotion and emotion is great emotion is the fact that somebody left uh, an impact in our life i know scott when i go and i've told you this i want there to be loud music a lot of drinking a lot of laughing a lot of crying more laughing more crying and then people passing out waking up in the morning going hey okay this is what from chris i'm going to take from this moment forward that i can use in in honoring his legacy absolutely and I want to share something beautiful that um, my wife brought up and um, she was saying it uh, the other day. She said, the amount of grieving you, that you do and the amount of sorrow that you feel isn't so much what you felt about the person, it's how much they loved you. 
So the magnitude of the love that Max had for so many people is going to make that grieving process tough. Yeah, because, no, it is. Because he did. And so yeah. my wife created a beautiful video that we're going to share right now, Chris, if we could drop that in. Um, so for sure. those of you who don't know Max and for those of you who do know Max, here's a little bit of uh, seeing who he was as a beautiful human being and a song that he loved as well. Yeah, this is uh you guys will definitely dig this. This is very beautiful. Um I would uh, I would I would recommend having something to wipe your face with uh from this. Let's go ahead and make sure you guys can see this, right? You guys ready to go? Here's Max. that mm. yeah yeah very beautiful yeah I and mean, i love that picture especially the i mean dude he's like <laughs> he's like hey chris i haven't met you but I'll, I'm, I'm gonna be beside you so um thank you guys for for creating that and sharing that that was um yeah yeah it's a um, uh, beautiful man i mean honestly you can see that you can see that in every picture you can see the um the smile and the heart and the warmth and you can see what he shared i don't even know him yeah but you do because you know me you know kim and, and you do yeah and that's that's yeah. the point of the show right here is mm -hmm. in our physical form we put so much we put so much focus on it you know how much can we achieve what's my title what am i um, yep they always go back to they say they don't they won't remember what you did but they'll remember how you how they how, they, how you made you them feel, feel. And that's yeah. I mean that's that's the beautiful pot. That's a beautiful pot. What the hell am I speaking Boston all speaking of a sudden? Boston. See, what am I going to become, Ricky Roush? Is that, what I, is that what my name was? Bobby no, Roush. I was uh, Marky Roush. Marky Roush. Well, we have a lot of beautiful people in the house tonight sharing um, sharing their love. We got Susan in the house. We got Larry. What's up, Larry? Good to see you. Good to see you, Paul. Great to see you. Uh, we got Lynn Serrano in the house. 
of course, our unfiltered family, Colleen. What's up, Colleen? Hello, Dallas, Texas. Uh, Lynn says, celebrating life. This is why we should celebrate life while we are here. Much love oh, to you guys. You. You, Lynn, you and I have talked about this so many times, and they really should be living memorials because, you know, think about the think about the people that are like depressed and sad right now, and the fact that if you just held them up in a higher light and treated them like if you treated them that they were gone, how many people would still be here? So yeah, I mean, we've got uh, we got Nick Merchant in the house. He says, love this man. He was like a second father to me when I was growing up. God bless and rest easy. The afterlife just got awesome. Sherry McQueen's in the house. Thank you for spending your time with us, Nick. Uh, Sherry's with us. Good evening, gents. Uh, David, David Hope is here with us. Thank you, David, for being oh, here. She beautiful man. He, he was with huh? he was with Max in the hospital. He went to visit him uh, right before he passed. So I'm sure. Awesome. Well, really thank you for being here, David. David shares with us. Uh, I remember when you would shake his hand, he would squeeze it so tight. I thought my hand was going to fall off. Yeah, I've I met some people like that. I, I try to hug like that. Honestly, I try to hug like, you know, people are going to be like, I remember Christopher's hugs. Um, Sherry McQueen also says hashtag priceless moments. Thank you for sharing with us. Yes. Uh, very beautiful. Colleen says so very sorry, Scott. Um, we got Susan in the house. She says, hello, everyone. We're sending our prayers and our love to Susan's husband, husband Weldon, yeah. who is currently, uh, has received a liver transplant and is, uh, is progressing very slowly, but surely, um, it came at the last minute. So it was a beautiful experience to, to see that Tom is in the house. What's up, Tom. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, Deborah, thank you, Deborah, for being in the house. She says, uh, having a hard time believing he's gone. Yeah. Yes. And that's, uh, gone, but never forgotten. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's the impact that he's making. He's making an impact on people that he's never met, including myself. So that's the beautiful part of what we could do with our legacy. Uh, Mark Huff says, uh, love us some max. Yes. Thank you guys for being here and sharing. Love you, max. Um, yeah. RIP brother. Um, and we got, uh, we got, uh, Audra English in the house. Thank you for being here with Audra. She goes, I appreciate you doing this for Max. He would have loved this. I'd be bought, I'd yeah. been bawling my eyes out watching his pictures. Yes, trust me, the guy in the bandana still cries too. Um, love you, Ellie. And Susan says, having a rough night tonight. We are sending lots of love and prayers uh, to you, to you and Weldon, definitely. Um, we love Max Freeman. What a sweet, loving man. Thank you guys again for, for sharing this experience with uh, the Goyette family and the Friedman family and us, your unfiltered experience family. So uh, yeah, Scott, what would you like to uh, carry on with next? So um, one of the things that Deborah said, you know, talking about Levis legacy, she can't um, even believe that, um, that he's gone. Um, one of the things that I think is really gonna help all of us in this process is realizing this is a commencement that we all go through. So it's a new beginning, but while we're here, in, in our individual paintbrush form, continuing to create and paint these beautiful moments. We have the opportunity to learn and grow from everything that he created while here. So these people who are gonna be here are some of the most beautiful human beings I know uh, today. And they're gonna share some of the most amazing stories about Max and hopefully people who are listening and watching can um, add their tidbits in as well. So um, we're gonna bring on my wife, Kim Friedman Goyette, who is the most beautiful human being I've ever met. And that's because she's 50% of Max. I'm ready? Yeah, and I'm gonna bring on. Hello, Kimmy. Kim, how are you? Sending you love and light and lots of big hugs from Southern California. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and and ne <laughs> next, <laughs> woo, yeah. Next, I'm gonna bring on uh, the other equal half that made Kim possible. And, uh, She's the silliest human being I know, and I love her to death and always possible. Ellen Friedman. <laughs> Hello, Ellie. Hi, guys. Great Good to, to see here. you. Hey, Ellen. Good to see you, too. And then Kim's equal opposite. Uh, if Kim were a boy, we've got Greg. <laughs> Greg Friedman. <laughs> What's up, Greg? <laughs> welcome to welcome to the family. Welcome to the unfiltered experience, the unfiltered hey, guys. craziness that we have here. Hey, Greg. Yeah, that was a beautiful video. Um, I know we were all absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad Chris talked for a few minutes so we could all process the video, right? <laughs> I tried. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, um, well, that's what we do. I mean, you gotta you gotta be real. I mean, that's one of the things that you and I, Scott, totally agree on. And the reason why we're so good together is the fact that we we truly believe in being real. We truly believe in being authentic. And for me, that's one of the the biggest 
takeaways I have in life right now is the fact of being who we are when we are with other people is such a magical feeling because there's like a true vibrational exchange when you're in company with people who truly are just being themselves. And I know we've all seen it, we've all experienced it and apparently, I mean, not apparently, but Max was a living body of that. Um, that's the way I live my life now. I just wanna be me. I just wanna be good to everybody. I just wanna be, I wanna leave a legacy that says, hey, that guy in the bandana, I looked at him, he looked like he was gonna kick my ass, but he's actually a really nice guy. Um, and, that, and so that's the, that's the beautiful part about what we're doing here today is we're, we're re-emphasizing to everybody watching this and listening to this on the podcast is that you have an opportunity in every action and every step that you take and every person that you meet to change an opportunity in their life. You know, I walk down the street and I smile and I wave at people. I open the door for people and you never know what that person might be thinking. They might be going to the store to buy Drano to kill themselves. You're like, hey, 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 or I'm talking to the cashier. Hey, how was your day? Or, you know, giving the homeless man some money and actually asking him how he's doing. There's a magic in everything that we can do every single day of our life, every moment of our life, if we choose to, if we choose not to be a victim and if we choose to be out there raising the vibration of the world. And I know Max did that for everybody here and uh, and beyond. A thousand percent. And Max is a, a living legend. Um, one of the words that Greg used so so kindly and so often was my dad was a legend. And, uh, and he's right. Uh, you know, it's funny, like going through that video, I know that the four of us were all in each of those moments for a split second in time. And then we were just getting pulled from picture to picture, like reliving that. And it was a beautiful experience. And so today, what I would like to do is talk about those moments, talk about what we pulled away from him, talk about the things that he was, that we can remember him by becoming. Because Max never, ever leaves this world if we can become the beautiful things that he's been to us. So let's talk about some stories. Who would like to start? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> who would like to start? Tell me a story about Max Friedman, because God, we could sit here for the next two weeks. Tell There's only 10 million, story. 10 million point two followers right now, right now. So just 10 million people. <laughs> yeah. if you guys don't mind. No stress. Um, so I'll start. I'm Kim, Scott's wife, Max's daughter, Ellen daughter and Greg's sister. And I want to first thank you guys so much for hosting this. I think it's really special and very touching to me and to our whole family. Um, I know that Scott had a special relationship with my dad. And so I know that he's, he's observing this whole uh, scene as it's going down and, and smiling for sure. Um, I'll start. My dad was pretty larger than life. He was quite the character. Um, yeah. He had a lot of funny quirks about him sure. and um, and just some of the things when he walked into the room, I mean, it really lit up. You knew that he was there. And one of the biggest things is his bear hugs. So he would embrace people so deeply. It was almost shocking to many people, especially people that didn't know him. We were all used to it, so we would just go in for it. But people, I'd bring new friends over, maybe even from college when I was going to school, and he would grab them and embrace them. And they were like, whoa, this is so crazy. But what I love about that is that he made everybody feel welcome, along with my mom. And uh, so we really were the go-to house when I was growing up. My friends felt very comfortable, even when they weren't having um, the best relationships with their parents to come over and hang out. They, everyone just loved to hang out at our house because they made everybody feel so welcome. And so I really, um, you were talking about what you take on, like what, what character traits you take on from people that pass. And I think that's one of the things that me and my brother, I see it too, and him and his family is that we always welcome people into our homes and um, and even, you know, my one of my friends, Lisa, um, when uh, she wasn't used to like, you know, families kissing and greeting each other and stuff like that. And so whenever I see her, like I always kiss and hug her and she commented on that. And so uh, and so anyway, it reminds me of my dad and my mom, my whole family. We're, we're big kissers and huggers. <laughs> Wow, well, you is... married the right person too, because obviously me and you are both like that, so it all yeah. works. <laughs> yeah, I found out the hard way, Kim. Thanks a lot. You should have you should have alerted me. <laughs> That's the hard way. It's, yeah, it's like it's a great thing. Like, okay, get off of me. Get off of me. Get off. Yeah. Of me. <laughs> you can't run away from from his arms. Too, wow. they're, they're too long. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was all, it was all good. It was all good. So when when you think back on your your experience in your life with your father, what is what is like one of the most important values that he instilled in you? Oh man, 
gosh, that's a great question. There's so many. Um, I do this for a living. Yeah, I would say I would say one of the things is just being there, like being reliable and showing up. Yeah, he was a very, you know, I'm I'm very I feel very blessed because I know that there's not there's many people that don't have a father figure in their lives um, or a consistent figure or someone that they can rely on. And so my dad was just always there, you know, whether it was through the fun times or the hard times, I knew that I could count on him and rely on him. And so that is, I think, a really special gift to give to someone to have that stability in your life. I mean, of course, my mom is, mom, you're all part of this too. I'm just focusing on dad. So. <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> you know, automatically get the kudos. So, but, um, but they were both my parents, you know, it's such a gift to have that stability because when you have stability as, as a young child, you can become anything, you know? And I really feel that my confidence um, is because of that it was a huge springboard for me to have that foundation to be able to know even when I was going through hard times um, or things were rocky that I always had that that house that home to go to so I really appreciate that and I Scott and I try to establish that in our own home nice that was gonna be my next question thank you for sharing that Kim is what what parental trait did you take from your dad that you've installed in Kayla hugs even though she doesn't want him <laughs> Oh, actually, she hates him. She, she hates him. Not a hugger with you two. I, I always go no. in for hugs. And, she's yeah, the anti hug. She's the she's the anti hug. She's so. actually really fast. She's just, more like me. She's, she's like just like what? Yeah. <laughs> no. She gives the like <laughs> the dead fish hug. I'm like, you need if when you hug, you need to use full uh, uh, arms. The, she's yeah, like. The yeah. <laughs> that is, isn't that strange? You know, when you think about genetics and DNA, like everybody else is huggers. And then yeah. isn't that crazy how we're all wired just differently and beautifully? Listen, life's all about lessons. There's something that she's 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 learning through us. Maybe maybe her lesson coming in this world is to hug more and she's not going to be able to avoid it because everybody on this call right now is going to hug the hell out of her and there's nothing she can do about it. Group hug. Oh, it's so funny in my house. This is a this is a beautiful this is a beautiful thing. And then we could transition to our next what we're gonna do next is uh whenever my wife and I hug, which is not very frequent. I'm just kidding. No, we actually hug a lot. When we hug, usually um either my son or my dog will immediately go family hug. And the dog, well, the dog doesn't say family, he has a hard time. He goes, Whoa, whoa, whoa. but he says family, and he comes over and he gets right in between us. And then my son immediately comes over, he's like, family hug. It's like that is one of the most beautiful experiences when you just get your group just in a huddle. It's like for no reason, like family hug. And you at first you're like, okay, this is awkward. And grandma climbs on, and, and you know, we got the cat and then the parakeet and then the mouse, and it's kind of like crazy, but it's like a group family hug. I mean, that's a that's the best thing, those moments. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Greg, listen, your dad has been a, a very funny person. And I know that right now, wherever his spirit is, and it's probably right here, he has uh, told us some silly stories. Tell us one of uh, the classic Max stories, because there's been plenty. Tell us one of the, the funny Max stories that we've all heard a million times, but the world hasn't. Hey, Scott. Hey, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Loud and clear. You sound great, Greg. Cool. Um, hey, thanks. First off, sorry, Scott. Just give me a second. <laughs> oh, um, Take your time. <laughs> hey, uh, Scott, Chris, thanks for taking the time, um, dedicating the show to my dad. Uh, I hope he's watching it. I know he is. And uh, hopefully we won't reveal too Cheers much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll open another beer um, I, right now. I also wanted to uh, say hello to my childhood friend who I think is still on, Nick Merchant. Um, so we grew up in Mohegan Lake, New York, and Nick Merchant and his family, they lived across the street from us. So we were childhood friends. We were always at each other's houses. And, uh, you know, it's we have, probably haven't spoken in 30 years. When my dad passed, we actually connected. And uh, Oh, my, my, my mom's over here. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's perfect, actually. But you know what? Hey, and, Alan, um, this is better because now we have the four perfect squares. You just need <laughs> symmetrical. It's like the Hollywood squares. No, no. Yeah. All right. So you guys can hear us? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay, cool. Um, David, David Holt mentioned, uh, <laughs> I just have a lot in my head. He mentioned that handshake, and um, I... 
It's true. Like my dad always was able to consume me. Whenever we did a handshake, we would do a lot of these like wars where we would see who could squeeze each other's hand more. And nine times out of 10, he would win. And honestly, even up until just a few weeks ago in the condition he was in, which was not good, you know, just very weak, body broken down. I mean, he still, he still crushed my hand, which was pretty awesome. Just to give some context, we're sitting here in my, my my parents' house. So here's my mom and my sister's upstairs. I'm here, um, and you know it was a, it's a it was a pretty emotional day. Um, the week he passed, you know, last week was was brutal. Um, obviously, inevitably, everything was just backed up. Work, life, everything, and so. Um, I, I, it wasn't until basically today that I was able to come back to the house, help my mom. My sister was here and it was actually a, a really nice day. And just to give a little um, background, you know, my dad, one of his last projects that he's very excited about, there's a shed in the backyard and uh, it was an old shed. And my dad said, Hey, I, I want to, you know, take the time and do a fixer upper. He could have easily just bought a new shed, but he's like, I want to just kind of rebuild it, just do a little handyman work. And him and his buddy, Robert Morales, who's who's here in Austin, they they worked on it together, and um, my dad was pretty pumped about it. It was just a, a project of his, and so uh, you know the reality is is that throughout the last few weeks, um, he wasn't really to help. He wasn't really able to help out that much on the shed. So he would sit kind of on the sideline and and uh, watch his friend Robert do it. And I know that crushed him. Um, you know, cause he wanted to be able to do it. He just was, was too weak, you know? And, and, and so the, the shed actually was about 90, 95% done. And um, so of course, in honor of him, you know, we're, we finished it off and we're almost done with it, but we, we did some work on it today. Uh, my sister and I, my mom, you know, kind of refereed from the side and we, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a pretty cool experience um, to be able to do this and, uh, so anyway, getting back to, um, you know, getting, getting back to your question, Scott, you actually broke up a little bit, um, on my end. So you were asking about one of his jokes. Hey, you can do a joke or any story. I actually, I like, I like where you're going with this because yeah. tell him what an amazing human being he was as far as being kind of a jack of all trades and be able to do so yeah. many things and how that was valuable for him. Uh-huh. Well, there's a lot of things that stick out for sure. I mean, certainly uh, what Kim said, just he was always there. He was, he was always there for me. I was in for good times and bad times. Um, I remember being in some really interesting times in my life and uh, <laughs> pretty tough times. And, and like he would come, you know, he would, he would drive a few hours and just come see me at college, you know, for certain things. And he just was always there. He, uh, he literally bailed me out, you know, uh, <laughs> in more ways than one. And, um, you know, but I, I, there's just so many fond memories, like one of his character traits, which was always concerning, honestly, is like, we would take a lot of car drives and I, I'd love you know, sitting in the car with him. Is this going to involve would, gasoline? He would just, he would have his eyes everywhere except on the road. He'd be looking at houses, pointing at houses, saying this, that, the other, this, that, the other. He would lean over, put his arm across like this cover your face you know he was always like whenever he was like most parents do when you're young right when you step on the brake he's like putting his arm over you like a seatbelt like that's gonna do anything and um you know he just he was like i was always going to be like that get back on the road like he's always just so observant and talking and looking at stuff and those are some some uh, you know my great memories are just taking a lot of car rides just looking at houses talking about construction you know architecture uh whatever and um but later in you know later in the years uh his driving actually <laughs> kind of worsened in a lot of ways and, and you know anyone who was driven in a car with him could attest to this but he had this thing where he would literally pump the gas with his foot he would pump the grit the, uh, the brakes with his foot and then instead of just driving like this he would just continually turn the wheel back and forth. So, I mean, it made a lot of people nauseous. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually still sick from a few weeks ago. I'm a little nauseous right now, just thinking but, about you it. Know, the reality is, is like, in the, you know, all those times you just feel sick um, physically. 
<laughs> you know, I'm going to miss those rides, honestly. Now. So, um, with, Safer. You know, with that, <laughs> with, with that I'll, uh, I'll pass the mic. Well, I, I, have, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah, thank, sure. you for sharing that. thank you for sharing that, Greg. What, what attribute of your dad's would you say is the most powerful that you would share with other men to mm. how they treat women? Oh, oh wow. It's a beautiful question. It's what I do for a living. Ask questions. <laughs> it wasn't even scripted. It just came to my head. It's kind of magic. Um, um, <laughs> I think, you know, for, for one, um, women are equal, right? Like a man isn't better than a woman, you know, kind of thing. Uh, the women are a little better. The uh, just, just ethnicity, race, like always was just so open-minded. My parents didn't care if, uh, I brought any, anyone home, man, woman, different ethnic backgrounds. They, they didn't care. You know, they just wanted me to be happy. Ultimately that's, that, that's what mattered most. And then, uh, yeah, just, just to be a gentleman, you know, just be a gentleman ultimately. Awesome. Thank you, man. Thank you for well, sharing. Think of this. Appreciate it. He was married to his wife for over 50 years. So, you know, we always talk about leading by example, you know, the guy was not perfect. None of us are perfect, but I'll tell you this much. 50 years and we're all still here together laughing and joking about and and here's the thing we would have teased him about his driving then now like we were like what are you doing <laughs> so you know we're all serious but we're all joking and we're all you know very connected and i think that's what he brought was exactly that was that that loyalty and and all that <laughs> right on absolutely anything else you would like to share greg oh geez i'm, I'm sure you know I could share a lot. Funniest story. Um, come on, come on. Funniest story that it's going to make all of us just like laugh and pee our pants. Oh my well, God. maybe maybe Kim. I, I don't know. I'm not going to pee my pants. Maybe um, Scott. Scott pees his pants. He I changed. No, no, no. Kim, Kim pees her pants. No, we can Scott, definitely. You did like 12 pants. times. He's the pant peer. No, he is. I watched him. He's like, I got to go more, buy more pants. Oh, so many. No, like the funniest story you, you can like. I can imagine there's a lot. I want funny. I, I, yeah. All right, here's one. Here's one. It's not that funny. It's kind of scary. Uh, <laughs> nice, even better. You. Funny and scary. I love it. it I mean, you could, you, you're good. able to laugh it off um, <laughs> afterwards. But so at one point um, before moving to Austin, I lived in in Southwest Florida, Naples, and uh, my parents came down to visit me. We were at this what's called Dog Beach. It's like this beach in this nice beautiful cove with a lot of mangroves and really just cool nature and the dogs would run in the water and it was like clear water beautiful sand and a lot of boats would come in and dock but it was an inlet to this like to the ocean essentially to the gulf and um you know one point my dad and i we probably like smoked a joint or something and we we're like let's go for a swim we jumped in and uh we, we started swimming and the next thing you know, we're just floating, you know, the water was just beautiful temperature and we're, we're starting to drift. And, you know, this was maybe like five years ago, six years ago. So, I mean, my dad was a swimmer. He loved swimming. He used to dive, um, you know, when he was younger and, but, you know, it's, he's older at this point and, and, you know, it was, it was a, a riptide and it was strong. And we were just, we couldn't get to the side. We couldn't get to the shore. And we were just swimming as fast as we can, as hard as we can to the side. And it kept pulling us all the way out, pulling us all the way out. Uh, and into the, you know, it, boats were around. And it was just, it was a very scary moment. Um, and I thought, honestly, I, I didn't know if my dad was going to make it. You know, it was like, it was like that scary. And so... Finally, we we got to the shore and we were like just all washed up and breathing heavy and you know we had to walk all the way back. It took us all night and anyway, it was just it's it was stuff like that that we would just get into these situations and uh, somehow come out of them, you know. And so it's it's a bonding moment. It was scary at the time, but then we laughed it off and we would we would just laugh laugh about that story because uh, could have been a different ending, but we made it. <laughs> Alan, tell it. Tell that's, us what, some, that, that's what makes the moments. Tell us some more stories about how any of us, you know, with Max barely got by because th there's a plenty of those. I like that theme, Greg. 
those, you know, we're, we're taking a step into something that's a little dangerous, but it always worked out somehow. Do you have any good story of like, you know, something that we did with Max, whether it was you, Greg, Kim, me, and we all came out alive somehow? Because there's plenty. <laughs> oh, there's, yes. Oh my goodness, there's so many. <laughs> this, is just a, this, this is just a nice story. So Max loved to swim and we lived near a lake. And he wanted to swim all the way across to the other side, always, okay? And it was in the summer. And then he would tie himself to the rowboat, and I'd be sitting in the rowboat like the queen of the Nile doing nothing with my cell phone in case something happened so I could call 911. Well, everybody <laughs> at the lake saw me sitting like I that. Like, had, I don't think we had cell phones back then, Mom. I, I don't could have had a pager. Could have been a pager. A pager. He, he had a pager there. forever. Yeah. something, just yeah. in case. And then I'd, everybody at the lake would see me like out there like Queen of the Nile. It was so embarrassing, but I, I was actually getting a ride and also helping him. So we did things like that. You know, we did a lot of crazy things, but that was, right, Kimmy, you remember. <laughs> everybody. Like, I have a feeling everybody, like anybody I've ever talked to from that Mohegan Lake area is like, do you remember the time, you know, they make it like it was one time, but it was always, they're like when Max used to pull Ellen in the rowboat across the lake, like right, everybody exactly. talked about that. Yeah, I, I actually, I got a, a text from somebody from Mohegan Lake who mentioned that. that legendary. It, yeah, yeah, it was his legendary. <laughs> um, there's, there's so many stories about Max. I mean, 50 years of stories. It was, <laughs> our life was a story, you know what I'm saying? It was, I mean, we, you know, I mean, there was a lot of love there, you know, like all marriages, ups and downs, but in the end, Max always had my back. That was probably, that is something I will never forget. No matter what, he always had my back. He always looked out for me. He was just that kind of a guy. And he looked out for my children too, and Scott and Nancy um, and his grandkids and other people too. He was just that kind of a guy. And um, I met him when I was 18 years old, you know, so I grew up with him. We actually grew up together and we really haven't even grown up yet. You know what I'm saying? We're like, <laughs> Truth. None of us have. So Tell us, so look at the pictures. You guys are having a great time. You guys yeah. are having a great time. Yeah. This is for Ellen, Greg, or Kim. So I love that theme. Tell us a story where he really stood up for people. Because Max was a stand-up guy who he wouldn't say a lot, and he'd kind of sit and he'd throw his joke in now and then. But he was always a man of principle, and that's something that I admired, you know, in him because I try to do much of the same. So being a man of principle in the moment. Tell us a story where he defended, you know, somebody, you know, even though. It might have been scary or whatever because he's got some of those good stories. Yeah, he has. He yeah, he does. He wants to take this one. <laughs> Kim, Kim's got it. Kim's got it. I feel it. Uh, yeah. Interviewing me says she's got it. Chris, can you put her on full screen for a second? I'm going to run to the bathroom. I have to go. To? I've been drinking too many beers. <laughs> you know, you take, I can just take you off screen. See? There you are. You can go potty, Scott. I don't want to make Kim's full screen. You want to be full screen? Oh, it's okay. So I, so I was. Um, I was kind of naughty in high -uh. school. <laughs> and you married Scott? Yeah. Really? The yeah, I got, in, I got in trouble. I like to party and all that stuff. But um, I do remember, I do remember that um, one time I was a freshman and I happened to get on the um, senior cheerleading squad. So we had an away game, and I guess we won. And I don't know who made this decision, but they let the boys you know, ride with the girls on the way back home, the football players ride with the cheerleaders on the way back. So someone had brought some beer, I guess they hit it on the bus somehow, and they were passing it around. And I was just a freshman with all these seniors. So I ended up, you know, of course, having some beer and, and indulging and all this stuff. And just like any stupid teenager, someone left all the empty beer cans on the back of the bus. So of course, we all got busted. We all got, um, walked you know to the principal's office and one by one all our parents got called in so my mom and dad showed up our principal happened to be our neighbor and my parents were like friends with friends with him essentially and you know i was in big trouble but my mom and my dad they always always had my back and always looked out for me and of course you know i was uh 
I was foolish, but I was also younger than everyone else. So they, they had a really good conversation. It wasn't, they didn't say not my child. She couldn't have done it. It wasn't like that where they were defending me uh, senselessly. It was, you know, you know, she's younger and she was impressionable and she just went with it. And they always, they always stood up for me that way. Um, and I continued to get in trouble a lot. And my dad continued to, um, he, he was always good. Greg, you could probably um, support this. He really liked to teach lessons, not just to me and my brother, but to everyone. And one of the things that he did for me, it, it was kind of horrifying for me. I borrowed my mom and dad's car to drive to school when I was in high school and I was running late. And so I parked in a, I guess it maybe was like a teacher parking spot or something like that because I was running like for school and I just left the car there. So anyway, I guess what happened was my dad needed the car for some reason and he went to the school and he saw the car and he, and someone, he got yelled at because they're like, you can't park in a teacher's parking lot. And he was so pissed at me. He's like, oh my God. And so he took the car and he drove it into the woods, like way up this hill into the woods and hid the car. So the bell rings oh, at the end no. of the day. I go out and the car's missing. Oh, and I'm like, that's awesome. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. I'm like, this is crazy. The car got towed. I'm in so much trouble. And I'm running around like a maniac, freaking out. And next thing you know, this white car catches my eye. It's up on the top of the hill in the woods. And I was like, you motherfucker. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, I love I it. Up That's there, so awesome. I drove the car home. And he was like, so how was your day, Kim? And I was like, okay, like I couldn't tell if it was him or not, if he actually had done it. So I didn't want to totally admit to it. I'm love like, it was good. And he's like, the car work out for you today? And then I knew that he knew. And he just always like... <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's the guy. That's that's the kind of dad I'm gonna be. My my son's gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna get this one over on my dad. I'm gonna be like, dude, you cannot mess with brilliance. I could mess with so many people so bad. My son's gonna be like, I'm gonna get one over on my dad. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get one over on you. That is so <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Kim. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love those stories. <laughs> what did you learn from that? What what was your takeaway? I mean, it's all funny and everything, but did you learn something from that? Yeah, I did. I learned something every time I did something stupid, but and that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, I would say being responsible, um, it really helped teach me to be responsible, especially because I was a new driver and that, you know, it was my parents' car and that I needed to represent myself well and I needed to do the right thing. So, I mean, all those lessons really rolled into it. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's, I mean, that's, even if the lessons, even if we learn lessons from our parents that maybe have not been so supportive or anything, I mean, I look at my life and the lessons I learned from my mom, not a lot of them were very supportive. So I had to learn the contra lesson, but in your situation, you can learn the beautiful lesson of what it means to play a prank on somebody, but in a way that they learn from it. So I'm sure you've done that with your daughter, right? Oh yeah. We do all kinds of so oh, tell, uh, yeah, tell, us, tell us about a time that you've done this with, with your daughter. Uh, there's so many. What I'm trying to Yo, think. What can of. we actually say on air? Because we're 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 messed up, Chris. We're not normal. You're, well, yeah, I mean, we're over the top. Tell the unfiltered show, Scott. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, the unfiltered experience. So, I don't want to put you on the spot. Perhaps, Greg, you have a story of the same nature that you could share with us. Come on, there's got to be a few. You look like a troublemaker. If your dad was a troublemaker, you had to be a troublemaker. I'm a troublemaker. I I guess not. He's like I doing this thing, and I'm like, dude, I love this guy. He's like, yeah. <laughs> right. like, he's, like my, he's like my dad that I never had. So I was like, cool. You know, I think the reality is, is I, I used to tattletale. So Kim's three years older than me and I used to tattletale on her. And I, I don't think I got in a, into as much trouble as, as you. But no, you were always telling on me. That's why I got into trouble. Um, Ooh. Uh oh, on the Maury Povic <laughs> show. Today we're going to talk about dysfunctional families and when the brothers and sisters air their junk out on the unfiltered <laughs> It was just looking out for your best interest. <laughs> it's true. Oh. He, he, he also had my back. It's true. That's good. Was, That's good. Was, good brother. Good brother. Good brother. I admit it. But um, <laughs> the reality is, is my dad... Um, he he pretty much could out party me. I mean, you know, it's the odd thing, I guess, in retrospect. I mean, when you're born into a family, right? You don't, all, all you know is what you know, and that's your family and your environment, right? So I always thought it was very normal, but as I got older, I was like, why why is my dad 
party harder than me. I'm, I'm in college <laughs> and I'm supposed to be able to party pretty hard. And, um, you know, so we, he, it was, my sister mentioned earlier, our, our house was this like revolving door. All our friends wanted to come over, hang out. And so, uh, you know, my parents are more like friends than parent figures ultimately. And my dad was really like a, a best friend. And so um, he would hang out, you know, even it, it was so, I mean, this, this just kind of sh shows you the type of guy he was, is that he was always there for us. He was always there for our close friends, um, a good good friend of mine growing up, Chris Riley. I mean, my dad went skiing, you know, just with my friend without me, like, you know, he would just, <laughs> he would just like hang out with my friends without me. So, I mean, that's kind of, it's so fun. It kind of like sums it up ultimately. Um, he's like a guy's guy, like to hang out and um, he could relate. Um, and so, I know I'm kind of getting off subject here because I, I have to think of a, another story um, like that. But he's ultimately he was he was a friend. There, there really wasn't anything. Um, and I don't know how many kids could say this, but there, there really wasn't anything my dad didn't know about me. That's pretty, that's pretty true with all of us. We are. Yeah. You know, <laughs> So, so Chris, you know, you hear me say the words, you know, authentic, vulnerable, and transparent. I'm pretty sure that there's nothing that, like, with all of us, we pretty much dump it on the table to a point of, your, you know, sometimes my daughter's like, did you have to say that? Did you have to be truthful? Like, <laughs> really? I, feel, really? Yeah. I feel like our, our family very quickly sees reality because there's not a lot of stuff that we're hiding behind. So, yeah, and that's, you know, that's, that's definitely helped by Max. <laughs> Well, I mean, Greg, based on based on what you said, this is a very important question for me because I get a lot of dad advice. My son's four years old and I get so much and I do a lot of research on this. So I'm very, but when you said this, I wrote it down. So would you have rather your dad be your best friend or be more disciplinary? Because I get, I get people saying, you know, don't be their friend. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a careful balance in that, but yeah. I have seen dads that had their, their sons being their best friends and they wound up going off in different directions. I've seen dads who were super di disciplinarians and their kids turn out great. What's the magic in that? What was the magic for you in that? Well, that he was a best friend, but he still taught you structure. Yeah, no, I think um, I, you know, I have two boys. I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. So nice. um, there's a lot of, um, of of that that parenting that you know is just kind of in me innately, and then ultimately I'm I'm trying to pass it on to my kids. I want to be their friends. I want them to be comfortable um, to come to me, you know. And so um, to answer your question, yeah, I'd, I'd prefer the friend. I mean, sure. I, you know, don't get me wrong. He disciplined. I was still scared of him when he got angry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so there was that fine line, but you know, I, I would much rather have that friend and yeah, you know, show me, you know, guide me, um, but don't really limit, li limit me. And, and so, um, my sister and I always talk about this and, and this is something, you know, that certainly I will, um, you know, I'm passing on to my kids and everyone parents differently, but my parents never really gave us any boundaries. They never gave us curfews. They never told us don't do this. And so the reality is that my sister and I never really uh, felt the need to push the boundaries. You know, it wasn't like we went off to college and all of a sudden it was like girls gone wild, you know, cause we're like, Oh my God, you know, I could just party and drink. I mean, we were already doing that. And so we were like, <laughs> really responsible. And you know, we, didn't, you know, we already we didn't, got a pass blue ribbon at twelve. We're good. Yeah, so it's um, yeah, and and so I mean, our family wasn't perfect by any stretch of the means. Uh, we were just unique and uh, more good than bad, really. Mm -hmm. So I have a, so I have a so I have a question for Ellie. <laughs> Ellie, right? so, Ellie May. Ellie May. Ellie May. <laughs> Ellie May. So, so nice to meet you here. I, I can't wait to meet you in person. Yeah. So what was, what was it that first attracted you to him? What was, talk to us about when you met him and what attracted you to Max? Because I mean, that's the origin story right there. We're talking about all the backstory and everything that's been a fallout of what his life created, but where did that start for you? Okay. So Max and I met at a camp outside of Rochester, New York. And what attracted me to him was he, um, him and two other guys, they were pretending to be the temptations and they were doing, and they were doing my girl. 
Oh, beautiful. I love smooth. Motown. I'm a Motown girl. So oh, that yeah. kind of drew me into him. Yeah. Um, and he, Max was shy. He was very shy. Um, but there was something about that that was nice. You know what I'm saying? I kind of liked that in a way. And um, he, he was, he was kind and he, and he loved to treat me like, like we went for burgers at this place called Perry's and I fell off my chair twice and I got back up and he said, I never missed a beat. I kept continued eating cause I didn't care. That's how I am. You know? So he loved that. Love you. Awesome. Yeah, but yeah. Why did you fall off the chair twice? <laughs> I was like twice. Why did you find, were you drinking malts or were you drinking I, like malt? We were having burgers, French fries and, and soda, but I, I kept leaning back off on my malt chair. Liquor. I just sounds like sounds like a scene from Back to the Future. Yeah, I was lucky yeah. I didn't hit my head. I was lucky like that's exactly what happened. But I had just really met him and he liked that because I, I was like I, it didn't phase me. <laughs> well, I, I, I think you still do that, don't you? Don't you still fall on chairs? Probably. Probably. <laughs> You're um, the chair faller. Okay. So we got Ellie Mae as the chair faller. Okay, good. I'll tell you one more thing. I have so many please. stories, but please, he, please share. I want to learn. I'm, I'm here to okay. listen. I'm here to listen. I usually talk. Um, I went to, I'm here to listen. Buffalo and he went to city college in New York and he used to hitchhike up to see me. And if he didn't have money, like, he gave like, his really? blood. Like this, this yeah. like hitchhike. Wow. He loved you. Right. And if he didn't have money, he I would, would donate probably. his blood. And they, in those days they paid you. So he would hitchhike or sometimes even fly, okay, and sometimes even take a bus. But then he would take me out for a nice meal with the money that he made from giving his blood. And that was very generous. Very, he was a very generous man. I would have just taken the blood. Years, I know. It's like, in all our years, um, you know how <laughs> couples fight over this, they fight over that, they fight over money. Money was never an issue with us. That's one thing we did not fight over. Because you had blood. And that's important. What? Because you had blood, and that matters. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, you know, after all, when you've been married that many years, um, what holds you together truthfully is friendship. That was and one of my questions. It's it's all about friendship in the end. Yeah. yeah. So what, how does that how does that friendship evolve? I mean, because when you think about life, and I think about my wife, we've been together for twenty years, been together for married for fourteen now, wow. and there is there is a, there is a transition transition period that goes from where you're romantically and like all oh, just all passionate, yeah. and then, then yeah. you have kids, and you become you do become friends, and there's a joke about you can become, yeah. become roommates, but yes. there's such a blessing in the fact that you can become so comfortable with somebody. Like I just want to spend the rest of my life with you because I know you, and I'm I'm like yeah. you're just like you. Your, your yin fits my yang, right? Yeah, that's, exactly. that's what I feel you guys had. How did, that, how, how did you yeah. how did you how did you support that? How did you foster that during your marriage? Well, at first it was all romance, you know, of course. And yep. then as time goes on, <laughs> Scott's laughing, but as time goes on, I mean, yes, Scott, still they romance. had coitus. They're still they're still oh, romance. I still, yeah, I know. <laughs> but but um, you mm -hmm. know, like I got. I would say, Max would say, um, so like, oh, we're both retired now, so what do you do? And I'm like, well, you know, you do what everybody else does when they're, you go for lunch, you go see movies, you know, it's like, I mean, it's, uh, my kids used to say that we were um, connected at the hip, but not exactly. We have two different personalities, but you know what? In, in a way, it's not bad to be connected like that. It really isn't because we had our own interests, you know, Good. Good. but we knew the other was always there and that's kind of a very secure feeling. That's beautiful. And thank you so much for sharing that, Ellie Mae, because now I'm going to call her Ellie Mae. My, <laughs> wife, my wife and I have that same relationship. I, I'm so thankful for you sharing that because I was I was coaching somebody the other, the other day and we were talking about marriage and relationships. I said, and she said, what is the, one of the most important suggestions you make for people when they're married? I'm like, do not lose your identity. Do not lose what it is that makes you unique. Right. I was married before. I was married for five years. When I got divorced, I had to I take a, I had to take a year off from all my friends to figure out who I was because it was always Chris and Tammy, Chris and Tammy, Chris yes. and Tammy. And then I swore any relationship I would get into in the future. And from that point on, I didn't get into many serious relationships. I got into some small time relationships. But my yes. long term relationships were always about that. 
can I can I remain who I am in my identity and not have you judge me or try to change me? I was with so many women like, oh, you'd be so much cuter if you did this or you, if you cut your hair, if you did this or if you painted your chimney. I literally broke up with a girl because she said you needed curtains and you need to paint your chimney. I literally broke up with her two days later. I'm like, you don't understand me. I'm not that person. No, no. And we're actually still great friends today. She actually met my wife. It's all great. Most of my friends, exes know my wife. It's crazy because I'm just that big person of love. But um, my point is the fact that when you lose your identity in a relationship, that is that is that is, that is the thing that will destroy the relationship. So I love the fact that you guys still got to remain who you are at your core and still yeah. be able to be your unique identity. You, your, your unique identities. Yes. <clears throat> yes. I've been talking all day. I literally been talking since nine o'clock this morning on Clubhouse. Scott knows Clubhouse. I bet. Well, he doesn't know Clubhouse. He knows about it. No, but it no, I've been on. I've been. I'm not. I've been on changing people's lives, and now I'm just like super tired of talking. So I'm I'll sure. Stop. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a really good point, Chris. And um, so you know, I have a big personality. If you know me, I have a. Uh, I'm very outgoing. I love people and everything. But Max was funny because I. Sometimes I liked him. I like to, I like, I like, I kind of like to, sh I said, I would stand back and let him, do you know what I'm saying? I don't know how to put it. No, no, I totally, I totally understand that. My wife does the same you thing. Understand She's like, that? You, yeah. need to, you need to shine. So I'll yes. back. I'm like, no, you need to shine too. You come yeah. on and shine too. But I, yeah. I totally get that. So I did that. And, uh, you know, I sometimes wouldn't, would kind of stand back and let him be the center of attention. And he liked that. He loved attention. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Max and I were a lot of I think he'd love this right now. Oh, I, God, I, he would. I, I, I think Max and I would get along this? great. I'll tell you what else he loved. He loved being funny. He no. would, he would, after he would no. tell a joke, he would say, hey, I was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I made it funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny, funny in my house? In my house, because I crack jokes all the time. And I'm like, being Mr. Funny is my wife and my mother in law, who been, my mother in law has been here since November of 2019 because of COVID. And like, At what, what time and what day? Like, like, yeah, I count the minutes. No, <laughs> they're not watching this right now. Well, they might, because I told them about this. Um, oh. No, but seriously, what the hell was I saying? Come on, Scott, tell me. You were come talking on, about um I, I lost you too because you no know, come on I told you I said you have funny being funny being funny being funny being funny, being funny. Being being funny. Being yeah, you were saying that in your family that you when you're funny that there's a like Max liked to say that he was funny and you were you bringing that around to you now I'm being funny <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's okay yeah no, it's okay I'm, 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 I'm just messing with you guys. Speaking of funny, my dad, um, he would often, one of his, I guess, like signature things to do is he'd find a joke that he really, really liked and he would just beat it to death, right? In oh. every scenario. So oh. I had told him just kind of generally this joke. Um, am, I, am I allowed to say it's dirty? Can I say it on the air? Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's a built an experience. So Come he on. Had, so he had a way of of taking the joke and weaving it into like his daily life so that you thought it was a real story. So he was he was an ultrasound technician. So he said he would I'd overhear him saying um, this joke to someone, but it, he would tell it as a story. So he'd say, yeah, the other day, you know, I was I was working on someone and I noticed um, it was a woman and I noticed uh, this this lady's tattoo. She had it like right on the inside of her thigh. And it was a tattoo of a turkey. And then on the other side, she had a tattoo of a Christmas tree. So, you know, I just had to ask her, like, oh my God. You know, what's what's the situation? Like, why do you have a tattoo of a turkey on your on your one thigh and a tattoo of a Christmas tree on your other thigh? And she said to me, Can you believe this? My husband said there's nothing to eat between Christmas and New Year. I uh, know, no, between okay. Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> I blew it. I'm not, I, he didn't tell it way better. No way. Yes. <laughs> and he, he would tell it to patients. He would tell it to patients. No, he would tell no it to, like, way. Like, Seriously? you know, anyone that would listen. Yeah, he'd love that yeah, joke. He would tell a joke to anybody. <laughs> anybody. And he'd always weave it into like you, you get sucked in because you think it was like the, you know he, it just happened that day to him and then all of a sudden yeah, you're like he was, oh. scene. he was a set scener. He, yeah. he, he was the true unfiltered experience. Yeah, yeah, he was. He had no filter. <laughs> Greg, yes, yes. I, so, I, I, I would like to say one more thing. I think it's so <laughs> that you're honoring Max on this show. 
Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, that's, that, I mean, honestly, that's what we're about. This is family. I mean, seriously, no bullshit, nobody watching, no numbers. Every, this is family. This is what we do. I mean, this is, we take an opportunity that something comes up in our life and if we can honor or eulogize or memorialize whatever we could do in our capacity, that's what Scott and I are about. That's what I'm always about is like taking something that is potentially quote unquote a tragic or a negative situation and saying how can we turn that around to blossom so many different people's lives and that's what we do on the show so no thank you for being on here thank you guys for sharing your vulnerability thank you for sharing your family on live tv in front of 10 million people i mean thank you <laughs> come on Scott, so, something intelligent. here's a question that you're not I, crying right now so i can tell you to talk i want to talk you guys are talking, talking right now so i can tell you to talk so real quick um, one of the things that I really wanted to do, because I think it's super important, is let's talk about some of the words that describe Max that we can yes. take and apply to our lives. Because, Greg, you know, you mentioned it the other day, and I, and I love that word. You said your dad was always a good listener. So, you know, that's something that we can plug in and we can say, hey, you know, Max isn't actually gone because I remember the time he listened to me when I was struggling with some stuff. And so now I can bring that with me and I can be that good li listener to Kayla or to your kids or to somebody else. So let's talk about a few of the things that we can immortalize right now, because anybody who listens to this now or later when people check in, what are the things that can live on forever from Max that we know about him? You know, for me, um, you know, the, the, the biggest one, I love the listener, but I also love what Kim said, and this goes to you too, Alan, you know, is, is that total acceptance. You know, one of the things that Kim and I are, we try not to judge people and be fully accepting of anybody because everybody's going through something. So those are two things, non-judgmental and amazing listener. What can we add to that? Let's make a nice list so that people can really kind of visualize Max doing that and hold those things and immortalize them right now. Reliable, very reliable. Yeah. Tell us the time he's reliable. Let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was, it actually got bad, but he, I think once he got his smartphone, he got very, like a lot of people was kind of addicted to the device. Um, but I selfishly, I knew anytime I would call the guy, he would pick up and he would pick up pretty fast. And that was very comforting, you know? Um, you know, it also, you know, woke him up all night because <laughs> when people called, he would always just, his ringer was so loud and everything, but yeah, he was always there. <laughs> <laughs> he was always just a call away or, a, you know, he, he was just always uh, there. So, yeah, reliable. Mm -hmm. I have one. Um, and I, if, can I can I have a second just to tell a little story? That, yeah. That, no, okay. no Kim, you, 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 yeah. you have a lot. You've exceeded your lot amount of time. Of course you can. <laughs> I'm done. Um, so I would say compassionate. I would say he was a very compassionate person. And I, I have a perfect example of it. Um, when I when I posted, you know, that my dad had passed away, I posted on Facebook and I, I got an incredible outpour of um, unexpected of people just from all like, you know, parts of the world, um, all different times in our lives that came out to talk about my dad. And one of them was my old boyfriend from high school. Um, and he reminded me of a story that just, I think is the perfect example of compassion. So again, I was an idiot. I had a, I had a teenage brain, wasn't thinking. And we, every year for um, New Year's, we would go to my grandparents' house to celebrate with the whole family. And it was fun, really fun up until a point. But when you're a teenager, you want to hang out with your friends. And I was, I was really disappointed one year. I think I might have been a freshman in high school or something like that. And uh, I was really bummed out because I couldn't hang out with my friends or my boyfriend, but I, I ended up going anyway. So my boyfriend at the time, he was two years older, so I thought he was great. Um, and uh, but he was into trouble. He didn't he he um, lived with his grandparents and uh, I, I'm not exactly sure where his parents were, but they weren't really in the picture. So, you know, he had, he had other things going on in his home and both my parents knew that. Um, and so I stupidly told him, I asked him, I said, what are you doing for New Year's? And he's like, we have nothing to, to do. And I said, well, then why don't you go to our house? We're not going to be home. I'm going to be at my grandparents house. You can hang out at my house. So it was like a really stupid thing to do. So anyway, we go to my grandparents' house. I call, because of course there's no cell phone, so I call my house. He answers the phone, okay? 
And he tells me that he um, had gone through my drawers and he read my diary and my diary was like about another boy and oh, that no. he got pissed and he kicked a hole in my wall. And so I was like peeing my pants because of course, you know, I'm like horrified. There's a hole in my wall that my boyfriend, you know, isn't supposed to be at my house while we're away. All this stuff is going on in my head. So I know that there's a hole in the wall. We go home. Of course, he's not there. He had already left. And I go straight down and I put a poster over the hole. Like I move a poster from my wall. I put it over the hole like no one's going to notice. My mom comes down five seconds later and, and is like, what's this poster doing here? It takes it off and there's a hole in the wall. And so I have to explain the situation that my boyfriend, you know, I led him into the house while we were gone and he kicked a hole in the wall. So they, so this is the way it went down. So my dad calls my boyfriend up and says, you kicked a hole in the wall and you're coming over tomorrow and we're going to work together and we're going to fix it. So this kid comes over. I mean, it's probably horrified, you know, like. How, thinking, how old were you? How old were you? I was in ninth grade. He was in 11th grade, you know, so it was, you know. Holy shit. And he came over? He came over. I mean, I to him balls. for actually coming balls. over. And my dad taught him how to do sheetrock and they fixed the hole in the wall together. So anyway, um, it, so what, what's interesting is that um, my old boyfriend, he put a comment and he said that your dad had such a huge impact on my life and that he could have gone two ways with me and he chose to show me a skill and, and show me compassion. So I thought that was so amazing that, you know, my dad really taught, took time to teach a lesson instead of just yelling at him or forbidding me to see him or, you know, whatever. It was really amazing. And that's a hundred percent who he was a hundred percent. That's the best. That's one of the better stories. And there's thousands of them, but that's a hundred percent who he was. Like, even if he's pissed at you or whatever, he would try to find something, a teachable moment in everything. And he would really make an effort to do that. And he was a human. He didn't do it perfectly all the time, but he did his best. And, and I think ultimately he was pretty good at it. Yeah. That's so beautiful, Kim. I thank you for sh for sharing that story because that's the same reason why I'm sitting here in front of this camera today is that there was a guy that saw something that most people saw in me was a derelict, uh, a seventh grade dropout. And I got around this guy named Bill White and he was a very successful person. He was a president of a trucking company. He lived in Fountain Valley. He was upper middle class. He had a beautiful daughter beautiful house, had the living room with the living room that you sit in that, that nobody sits in, you know, and then there was me and dating his daughter, like total wrong side of the tracks type, type of thing. And also my, my girlfriend says, you know, my dad wants to, my parents want to meet you. And I'm like, literally long hair, beard, you know, smoking cigarettes, seventh grade dropout was homeless for four years. And I meet this guy and I'm literally like almost shitting myself. Like you guys have like nice furniture and stuff like that. Like I lived in the backseat of a station wagon, you know, you guys have like all this stuff. And I was just like, and I'm like, He's gonna see right through me. He's gonna go, you piece of shit. Don't marry, don't, don't even touch my daughter. Don't even date my daughter. But he didn't. He was just like, So Chris, tell me about yourself. And tell me what tell me about you. And we would sit there and I was 16, I was seven, I was 17, 18 years old. He would let me drink. And I was just like, wow. And we would sit there and have these fascinating conversations. And ultimately he's like, why don't you go back to school? And he he didn't see me as the package. He saw me what was inside. And that's one of the biggest lessons that I take away from that. It sounds like Max was the same individual, that he saw what was inside of people, not what was on the exterior. And that's the thing that Scott and I preach about in our coaching program and our in our shows. Everything is about don't look at what's the outside. Peel, 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 peel a motherfucker back and see what's on the inside and then grow from that, right? He did that 100%. And that's beautiful. I mean, that's that's what we want from you guys that watch this show is to be able to take this information that we're sharing and be able to go out and, and, and expand upon it. Watch the show, but don't watch it and go, oh, that was really cool. I feel better. Turn around and go go take that to your family. Go take that to your friends. Go take that to your, your Facebook community. Go out there and give love. That's the purpose of this show. That's the purpose of eulogizing Max and being able to realize that what an impact he made in this life is that you turn around and go make an impact in somebody else's life. Take the gratitude that you get from this experience and go out there and bleed it to other people. Go 
go call somebody you haven't called in a while. Just trust your intuition and say, hey, you know, I feel like calling this person or I feel like telling this person something because guess what, ladies and gentlemen, our next breath is not guaranteed. Nobody, not mine, not Scott's, not Kim's, nobody's, not my son's, not my wife's, nobody's breath is, is guaranteed. So why are we wasting all these moments thinking and shooting on ourselves and waiting for the perfect opportunity of the someday game? Scott, you hear me talk about it all the time. Okay. Someday. Oh, maybe someday I'll do that. You know, one day I'll do that. Where's the one day, right? Max lived his life up until his very last day. And that's something I, I, I respect and I admire. And that's what I do. Scott, you saw me. I'm like, if any moment I go, the last thing I say, hopefully help somebody. That's my goal in life. So I love the fact that we're doing this. So thank you guys for sharing this. I mean, I know it's very personal. It's very raw. It's very real. It's in front of 12 million people now. Um, but <laughs> no. No, seriously, I, I just feel, I feel honored and moved to be a part of this. I feel like I'm infiltrating like this weird, like, you know, like you, like I'm like a, uh, a party crash into a, to a memorial. So just thank you guys for having me here. So, and thank you very much, Chris. And you're appreciated, of course, and, and you're part of the family. So thank you. And when you get to Austin, you can hang and play with these people. And trust me, they're as fucked up as you think they are. They're amazing. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, well, they're half like you. There you go. Yeah. So I want to share something with you guys, too, um, because one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm going to share a word and share a little thought about Max and, and then we'll come back to you guys, but I want to share. So, you know, Max and I, of course, you know, when you're, when you're marrying somebody's daughter, that's a, it's an interesting thing, you know, to, to, to be accepted in the family, you know, as, as a dad, you know, I look at my daughter, I can't imagine, you know, who's going to be a partner to that person. It's a, you're not sure who that's going to be and you want it to be the perfect person. So, our relationship was, you know, a lot, I know a lot about Max and, and I've, I've joked with you guys, maybe things that nobody else knows and, and that'll go to the grave with both of us, you know. But one thing that I really love about that guy is when we were together, we always wanted to just kind of just just embrace those moments like there was no tomorrow to a point that Greg sometimes might have looked at us and be like, guys, calm the fuck down. Just slow down there. All right. Just calm down. But all jokes aside, you know, we made it through some crazy years. And one of the things that I did today, I was redesigning my tattoo and I made a decision to, and you guys will see this, but up here it says in the clouds, um, you know, above the, this, like in that big tattoo well, I've got on my arm. Us. Come on, let's see a preview. It, it, you can't see it. It's like, it's all covered in dark. Like it's like, I, I'd show you, you can't, I can't pull the stuff all off. It Real says cool. to the max and it's on my arm. It says to the max in this beautiful script and it's in the clouds and it's going to look three dimensional coming out of the cloud. So you'll be able to see that, but it's, it's awesome. It's going to be That's so amazing. cool. So, but it's That's in there forever. Cool. And so what I wanted to say for like an adjective or a verb or a certain word is I literally want to coin the phrase starting today that we're just doing something that's awesome. We're like, how you doing it to the max? And I want to start <laughs> using that phrase. Because honestly, we could, I mean, it's, and that was his real name. It wasn't Maximilian. It was freaking simply Max. Like he had no middle name, nothing else. It was Max. So really? somebody wow. nailed that when they, you know, it was perfect. So <laughs> when we're doing something, we're like, how are you guys doing? I'm doing it to the max. To the max. <laughs> and, and I want to, I want to really change, start we saying change that. Our, we, Scott, we should change our, instead of just jump into it, we should change it to the max. Hashtag, to, to, dude, we can hashtag right, we, the shit out of everything. It. It's to the max. It just jump was into it. It's kind of lame, but to the max is like, so that hashtag from now on, everybody start using that. Whenever you do something that kicks ass, to the max. And it's it right is. here. We just, we just changed it. Let's jump into it. Let's, yeah, sounds to the max. Like, yeah, Unfiltered no, experiments to the max. To the max. I love it. Unstoppable. It, it's on my arm. It's not going anywhere. So and it's still stinging. So it's all still too real. So we're good. <laughs> oh, you're so cute. I guess I could probably. I mean, it's half. On his arm. It, it's half done, so it's not worth looking at. I want to see. Oh, you see the whole thing? Because I mean, like, it's not even colored in. Like half the stuff, he had to do half it because he was already working on me for like three and a half hours. So we're doing it in two parts. Nice. But, so cool. So who would like to share next? What else? What What else would you like Another to? Word. I mean, I have lots of questions that could uncover a lot of stuff, but I also want to respect everybody's time. We've been going for an hour and thirteen minutes. Um, we have a lot of great comments in here. I'm not even going to address to try to talk about them or. Um, yeah, I mean, it just Robert's been in the house. He's like those moments are huge. That's awesome. Um, Glenda says, Glenda, we're sending you love and light. We, uh, Glenda's been having some medical situations. Um, I need someone like this in my life. 
Yeah, just be who you are, Glenda, and you will find that right person. I mean, would you? I mean, Ellie, when you think about when you met Max, who were you being? Were you being yourself, or were you being somebody else? I was a little bit hippie. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit funny. I have to listen, like the funny and share thing. A little bit kind of yeah. Marie, Marie, a little country, and all. a little bit of country, a little bit of rock and roll. Like uh, like Joan Baez, like long and straight, parted down the middle. So we were. You there know, a story about Joan Baez? It was, it was in the sixties. You yeah. know, was, I heard about a story about Joan Baez. Tell us a story yeah. about Joan Baez. Max told it many times. We can all tell it. Something about eggs. I think he had breakfast with Joan Baez. He made he breakfast with Joan Baez. Made, yeah. Woodstock. Woodstock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we got married in 1970, and um, Max and I always said the two best things that happened to us was having Kim and uh, Greg. That yeah, that guy. <laughs> we always <laughs> we always said that. We always said that. Uh, we had children young, you know, and. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like regret. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, hey, Greg, you know, sometimes the second kid is overwhelming, you know? It's, it's a lot, you know? No, 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 no regrets at all. Um, we were just young and kind of carefree and, you know, we played all kinds young, of Young, dumb, and. Yeah, we just were like that. That's how we lived our lives. You um, lived your life, though. That's the important part. You lived it. Yeah, we did. We did a lot of things. Absolutely. Yeah. We did. And we said, you know, we'll continue to. And so will Max, you know what I'm saying? Um, in his own way. But um, he's going to be greatly missed by so many people because the outpouring of love this past week is unbelievable. And, and we're so grateful for it. We're so grateful for it. It helps you. It helps you get through it. You know, absolutely. And, and, and I want to I want to take a risk here and ask you a very personal question, because I have somebody that has reached out to me for coaching and I don't think I'm a, the right coach for this particular situation. But what do you say to and I'm going to put you on the spot here and I apologize, but I, I think that you're strong enough to handle this. What do you say to people out there who have lost their significant others after so many years of being bonded? How do you help those individuals? Because you seem very strong in the moment. I know that you have a lot of emotion going on. But what recommendations would you have for somebody who's dealing with that? Because I know somebody who lost their loved one many years ago and they are trapped in a, in a very bad cycle that I'm trying to help them with, but I'm not sure if I can. So what would you say to people who have lost their significant others and how to move on from that? So I'm still in the process because it's so new. You know what I'm saying? Of course. So of course, um, having the my family surround me with love is amazing. I have a dog that I adore and he helps me. Um, just friends calling and just I, I like to talk about it. I like to talk about Max. I like to talk about what we've done in our lives. And uh, by talking about it, I feel a lot better. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I want to keep his memory alive. And um, it's hard. It's, it's, you know, like I say, this is just the beginning for me. So I'll let you know in another year, Chris. Okay. Back in the I, <laughs> yeah. I, I say I send you massive amounts of love and respect for even attempting to answer that question because I realize that's raw and that's new. But what you said is so beautiful because when I think about in my own personal journey of people who I've lost, um, and I've lost quite a few people. I remember one particular situation. I lost my little sister for a lack of a better term. She was my ex-wife's sister who I developed a very uh, great relationship with. We've all remained family. It's the crazy thing about me is that my ex is my ex-wife. She knows my current wife. They've been on my other radio show together. I, I live in a world of love. I really truly do. So there's like nobody that's not in love in my family. But when, when after I got divorced, I coached my little sister, if you will. And she suddenly died when she was young. And I had to get the feel, I had to get the memory or I had to get the meaning out of that situation because I'm not a very religious person. So I could not say, oh God needed another angel. I was like, why in the fuck did you take this girl? She, why did you take this? She's a mother of a three-year-old son. Why right. did you do this? And in that process, I had to really understand what I could do from that moment to live in her honor, to live in her legacy not to be mad, not to be pissed off, not to take it selfishly from what I lost or what I felt her son lost. I had to live in the moment of like, what can I do to honor Tiffany? And from that moment, I have learned so much about, you know, when we pass on to our other journeys and that everybody's still around us. I have had, I've had three psychic readings in my life and everybody has said, each one of them has said, there is this certain personality that's around you. And they've identified that personality to be the same personality 
three independent psychics have said there's this like gregarious personality and there's like this more calm personality i'm like i know those two personalities are around me so for me when i think about this somebody we pass on from this physical realm for me when i think about my son i told my son if you ever hear i love you i love you i love you at three times in a, in a, in a sentence that's daddy talking to you so i live in that honor and that legacy of when we pass on from the physical sense we're still here always in the soul sense so talk to us a little bit about how that you can what have you heard have you have you seen any signs from yes that tell you yes, he's I still have. Here? okay talk to us about that thank you okay um so I'm trying to think if it was the night that we left the hospital. When, when, were you were you with me, Kimmy, that night when the first storm came? Yeah. The, the first storm. Well, this is after um, he passed, right? Yeah. Yeah, that night. Yeah, that night. That night. Crazy storm. We had this Shoes crazy storm. I don't even think the weatherman predicted it. Wow. Crazy, short storm, so heavy. Oh, I've got a storm. Hell, everything, and just for a very short time. I think that was Max, because the next day the sun came out, and I, this was my feeling. He was saying to me, um, move on with your life, you know, there's sun ahead and that sort of thing. But when I said goodbye to Max, I whispered to him several times, you need to give me signs. That's what I said to him. You need to give me signs, you know? So I, I, I've been waiting for signs and I've had a couple more. Today I had a really weird sign. <laughs> I mean, it literally a sign. Are you it, sure? I went shopping at Home Depot and in this, a brand new bag, there was a, a, a little, it was a sign. It was a notice. It was about wedding bands and it said something about love in a Home Depot bag. It said infinite love and it was in a brand new like bag. There was nothing. Yeah, it was so weird. No yeah. coincidences. No coincidences. Unbelievable. That is yeah. so freaking awesome. That is so yeah, Scott. You didn't know about that because that happened. No, that's new. <laughs> yeah, that's something new. Yeah, but that's uh, incredible. Oh, there's another sign I got the other day. Um, so we were planning something for Max, like a memorial or something, and uh, and Max always liked to be a part of everything. He could never be left out. He, he had to have a voice in everything, and uh, of course he. He was up there, so we didn't, you know, we planned it. And, uh, but I went to plug in his phone. I went to plug in his phone, and it was, I never heard, I never, after we planned it, after we planned it, I went to plug in his phone. I heard these two really weird sounds I never heard on a phone. And that was Max approving of this memorial. It was like saying, go ahead, do it, because it was the two weird sounds that I never heard on a phone. It is the perfect celebration, though. I mean, it's got everything he needs and more. It's, it's got booze, it's got barbecue yeah. and late night pizza. Right. And yeah. I've got a, I got some people who are going to bring some drugs, so we're good. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> I no didn't just say that. No I have to stop somewhere. <laughs> Come on, Scott. You're the co-host. Come on. I can't keep talking. I'm, I'm in jeopardy of saying something really stupid, so just help me out here. Well, we say stupid things all the time. That's what we do. So let's 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 get a couple more words. So we've got some really beautiful words to to take and essentially amplify and plug into, you know, the things that we all do, but it's fun to actually see the things that we've built and become stronger, you know, and because of Max, you know, whether it's patience or listening or being the life of the party or being funny or driving poorly, you know, whatever your thing is. So what else do you guys got? What are some other words? We're getting, we, first of all, you know, Ellen, to your point, um, you know, we're going to label to the max. So, it, you know, if you want to keep talking about them, it's not going to stop because we're going to get every single person we know to keep saying to the max. So a max story is going to come up to a point that you might be like, all right, now shut up. You guys keep doing it. We're going to just keep talking and keep talking. Yeah, so but he's I like not going anywhere. Max. I think that's great to the max. I love that. We should put that on max fest to the max. And so we actually have the T-shirt. Put it on there. Yep. It's very That's cute. Good it's on my good. arm, so it's not going anywhere. It's extremely permanent at this point. So, I well, hey, I just, I just, I just have to identify our uh, our family here. Uh, we got so many people here in the house tonight. Robert's in the house sharing some brilliance here. Um, apologies, Robert. We're not going to sit there and put up all the comments, but uh, we just want to thank each and every one of you guys for spending your time here on a Friday night. We got 19 souls here watching us tonight, and we just welcome you to say something about Max or say something about this experience. Share with us how you're feeling at this particular moment. We're going to wind down here pretty quickly, but uh, we just appreciate each and every one of you spending your time here because this is about impact. This is about what we, each and every one of us is here to do. We're here to leave an imprint. 
And Max's imprint has been massive. I never met the gentleman, but now I feel like I know him. I feel like he's enveloped me and I feel like just charged. So I'm like, let's go do something crazy and have fun because that's the idea about life. That's what me and Scott talk about all the time is like existing or living existing or living scott was like let's go rent bikes i'm like hey rent bikes whatever we're renting bikes we're like we try different bikes we're having fun go experience life ladies and gentlemen life is like this it's like a blip i was looking at pictures the other day and i saw when i saw max's video that made me think about it but i was looking at pictures of my son the other day you know on facebook it says here's your memories and i'm like son's four years old so now i have like four years of memories i'm like holy fuck, it's going by life is going by so fast ladies and gentlemen what can we do from this show we can take from this show and go back to our families like we said before go back to our communities and 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 lend this love lend this connection lend this brilliance the fact that we're not going to judge people anymore we're going to love them and understand them right i mean come on scott that's what we talk about is seeking to understand then to be understood to be able to make that impact in our world let's 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 not focus on our problems let's not focus on our differences let's focus on our similarities yeah and that's you know, so so I'm going to be very honest, too. So Max was especially over the last few weeks, you know, he was he was somebody who was extremely tolerant, but he did not tolerate intolerance. And so he was making a lot. And and, and I'm of the same the same no. like DNA on that one. Um, but he was getting very frustrated with people who were, you know, being um, disgusting toward Asian people because he's got Asian grandkids. Um, you know, being Jewish, he was really it, he had an issue with people who were being racist in whatever way. But he definitely started being vocal. You know, he would always have the conversations, you know, between us. So I think this and I think this is this would be OK for me to say on his behalf. I think we've got to accept everybody where they're at in their journey and we've got to love each other even more. Move past the fear, yeah. but not tolerate those who are intolerant. So we've got to put a stop to the bullshit when people are just being unreasonable and unfair, but we've got to at the same time, love all our neighbors and just truly embrace humanity. And so hopefully the things that he stood for, you know, some of the things we talked about being accepting and all those things, um, we can become a little bit more of that. And, and I know that we all can, cause we all do it. And in one sense, there's no rush. We live in an eternity, but in another sense, why not now? And I think you'd agree with that. Why not now? And with him looking down on us, and we've got phrases like to the max and all the things that we've learned from him and those things that we can commence to use today moving forward. Um, I think we've got a lot to work with. So do you guys have any final things that you guys would like to share? Any parting words? Or should we show the video one more time too to end for those people who came late? You, you let me know. You guys have any last last words any beautiful things to share what's the one last thing kim's got something great i can see her well i just i it's not it's not a story or anything but i i just want to say that um i feel very blessed to have my dad in my life i mean I feel so lucky so many gifts that he i mean if you really think about it i mean a a, a little baby's life is so precious and to have two beings care for that being like throughout my whole life it's so incredibly powerful and um and because they supported me so much i feel like i have the confidence and the um the tools to support my daughter and hopefully she is able to do that for her children if she's blessed enough to have them and so i i really feel like people have such a huge impact on on other people and when I look back on all the great memories, it was all the little things, you know, it doesn't need to be the big things. It doesn't need to, um, you know, we were never rich growing up. We, we always felt like we had plenty, but we, but we didn't, whoops. What happened? Oh, oh her phone died. Oh, <laughs> she'll come down. She'll come down to you guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm here, like, what happened? here she comes. <laughs> wow. My battery. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens. So now they're so, gonna go back to the B studio. Uh, so what come I on, in. oh look at the now. love. Look at this. Oh, we, we end on a group hug. Yeah. It, <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's so fireside. It it's the little things that count. I mean, one of the Dude, things that I remember most is um 
every morning recently, like as an adult in the past several years, I, I go for a, a run around a certain area. And my dad, uh, I always ended up timing it to where my dad drove by on his way to swim class. And he would always beep and wave. And it's those little things that I reflect on now, now that he's not here. Like, how amazing was that? That I got to see my dad every single day. And that, you know, it was just such a a great, um, a beautiful connection. So I'm so grateful for that. Thousand percent. Yeah, sorry, Moment. Greg. Sorry. Moment. <laughs> it's all about, it's Greg, all actually, about moments. You look really cool just like that with one arm in. Like, it's like a model. <laughs> like, you guys look like three, like, family models. For, right. Like, here, 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 like, hey, Scott, just yeah. everybody smile. <laughs> I think this is a wonderful yeah. tribute to Max. Chris, you, I would love to meet you someday. You oh, it's going to be soon. Great guy. Soon. Great guy. Thank and you. Scott knows how I feel about him. Right, Scott? Oh, we've had some good times together, Ellen. <laughs> yes, we have. And the great thing is, at the end of it all, your hair still looks good. It's amazing. <laughs> no matter what we do, your hair always looks good. Great. What did you do to her hair, Scott? No, she. So you know why she got pulled in the rowboat? Because she did not want to mess up her hair, and he was he honored that. Oh. She never wets her hair. No, she would. She was. She was like, "Can you just pull me in the rowboat?" He's like, "Okay." <laughs> nice. This is. I mean, honestly, guys, this has been an amazing experience. This is something that I, I've been in broadcasting now for. Geez, I mean, broadcasting. I've been doing podcasts and shows for seven years now, and I've never had. An experience like this so i thank each and every one of you for allowing me to partake in this experience and you know sharing the life and the brilliance because i mean scott you know i talk about i mean all my hashtags are no regrets no regrets and i think about every moment and what i'm living in and i used to be pontificating about the past and being like armchair quarterback oh i could have done this i could have done that or i'm pontificating about the front that like okay i got to do this a, a plan a b c d and e like max signified the fact of like you saw the pictures, he's like that every picture I saw him, he's like, like, oh, <laughs> like, welcome, welcome, the experience, welcome, whatever. But here's my attitude towards it. You can see that there was never experience where he's like, he's like, we can, all take that away. we can all take that away from this experience. It's like, you know what? So much stuff we take personal, right? Think about how much stuff we take personal. I was talking to my coaching client yesterday and I asked her like seven times. I'm like, why are you taking this personal? Why are you taking this personal? She's like, why am I taking this personal? I'm like, why are you taking this personal? Right? It's so amazing how we do those things. But the brilliance of what Max left and the legacy that he did, I'm so honored to be here with you guys. And uh, the, everybody here in the chats, I mean, you guys have just been amazing. We're going to go back and check out all these, all these comments. But um, you guys have just been absolutely phenomenal. Scott, family. Other ideas, other conversations, other stories. I mean, I could ask a bunch of questions to, to lead to more stories, but I want to be respectful for your time. I, I just have one thing, um, and this is maybe just a, a life lesson for your um, followers, is that one thing, you know, even though selfishly, of course, I want my dad here, you know, to have experiences with us, and, you know, that, and, you know, we all do, all three of us, everybody that knows him. But one thing that I can safely say, and I'm speaking for my mom and my brother and, and everyone else, is we have no regrets that we know that he loves us and that he knew that we love them. We, we said that all the time. We always communicated love. And so my, my thought, or I guess maybe my point is, is that you don't wanna wait. Don't tell someone you know, don't don't forget to tell someone that you love them because you never know when they're going to be gone. And I feel very good that there's like a very obvious and outspoken love between our family. I can't agree more. Yeah, no, there's one there's one thing that you know Max you know made sure of. You know, we've made sure of. We've all made sure of is constantly saying I love you, constantly hugging, constantly saying goodbye. Con you know. We're, we're always, I, I feel like if anybody went at any given point, you wouldn't be like, I wish I said this or I wish I did this. So um, I echo that a thousand percent. So do you want to run the video again? Let's go for it. I, 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 th I think as a tribute to Max, we run the video one final time and um, we say thanks to Kim, Greg and Ellen, run the video one final time. We'll do a quick closing. Oops. Hang on, hang on. Oops. Does that work? 
<laughs> we'll just anything else you want to add greg or ellen before we finish up because i think i'd like everyone to see the video again too um i'll just say that uh i feel like i have big shoes to fill now um carry the legend on a lot of people say that i look like them a little bit, little bit. And, uh you know I, I hope i could uh you know fill the shoes and represent well that's a guarantee you will brother you <laughs> will there's no doubt there's no doubt i i when my mom when my mom left this journey um it was like this baton like my mom and had a very my mom and i had a very dysfunctional relationship but when she passed on i was there and i held her hand and i told her mom it's okay stop the fight stop the fight stop the fight stop the fight let go let go she did you know we went on from that and what you said ellie was so beautiful and i forgot about this until this moment but i want to share this my mom my mom and i had a very i mean scott you know this a very cantankerous relationship i mean literally i was the last one that stuck with her when everybody else bailed on her and i stuck with her for a particular reason uh, because of loyalty and love and what we represent here on the show and what scott and i represent in our group coaching program and everything else that we do um when she passed it was bittersweet when i watched her take her final breath and i watched the the the, the thing go like that i looked at my wife and i said okay I said, can you please let the front desk know? And I walked outside and it was July 31st. It was 1.33 in the morning. I remember it vividly. And it started pouring rain. It started pouring rain. It was July. It was literally pouring rain. And I walk outside and I'm, I literally have a Jack Daniels and Coke. Because I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this drinking. So I took a Jack, I took a big thing of Jack Daniels and Coke up there because the nursing home called me and they said, we don't think your mom's going to make it through the night. So I was like, all right. We gotta go. My wife said we gotta go up there. I didn't want to go up there, so that's another story. But when I sat out there and I looked out at the view, so her nursing home was like up on this view, and my house was down there, so down the hill. And I just sat out there and I was looking at the lights. And I was like, wow, wow, she's gone. It started pouring rain, and I felt cleansed. I felt cleansed. I felt given permission to move on in life to carry the torch of what she was trying to teach me. She didn't teach me in the greatest ways, but she taught me a lot about tenacity and about being unstoppable, about having no excuses, about living with integrity and honor. But I had to tweak it a little bit so I didn't piss everybody off in my life. Um, so I just thank you guys for being here and sharing this experience because that, I mean, what we've learned from Max's legacy and his life has been absolutely beautiful. So let's just go ahead and uh, transition to the, the, to the video and, um, we will end right shortly after that. So let's thank go. you guys. Thank you so much. No, thank you. You guys are beautiful people. So um, let's go ahead and go with that and let's enjoy. I turn the music up, I got my red clothes on I shut the world outside until the lights come on Maybe the streets are light, maybe the trees are gone I feel my heart stop beating to my favorite song And all the kids they dance, all the kids are back But tell me more, it feels like another laugh I turn the music up, I'm on the world side
Ladies and gentlemen, Max Friedman. Beautiful. Final words, final thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, we have uh, some amazing comments here. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Uh, we'll Hi, Nick. Debbie. Hi, Deb. Tom, Thomas is here. He Hi. says, uh -huh. hey, love you all very much. We got lots of love here. Who is Carol Boyer? It's my aunt, my grandma's. I'll explain later. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that name. Yeah. No, she's, so, been, she's been uh, kind enough to follow so, what we're doing uh, here. Family, what kind of what kind of final what final comments would you like to have before we close out the show? And then Scott and I close it out. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Thanks to everyone who maybe didn't tune in, but we'll catch this on the uh, flip side. And um, you know, uh, hopefully, this helps influence just one one person. That's all it takes. Yeah. So, yeah. And I would just say, um, surround yourself with people that you love. Don't bother with the other people. That just, you know, it's, it's going through this. I feel so much love, and I'm so grateful that I established wonderful relationships prior to this, you know, extremely powerful and challenging event. And um, I feel so blessed to to have the support that we do. And I would say, do unto others as you would want others to do unto you. Try to live your life like that. Yeah. Beautifully like said. That. Beautifully said. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. Scott and I are going to close it out. Thank you guys. We love you. Thank you for sharing your soul and your family here with us tonight. Seriously. Much love. Can't wait to be you guys in person. It's going to happen. So love you guys. Thank you. Mr. Goyette probably one of our i don't know i would say maybe our, one of our most emotional impactful shows how are you feeling and thank you brother for sharing this with your family and everything else with us so yeah, yeah. i mean um I, I would definitely say for me it's the most emotional um i would say the most um potentially emotional across the board for anybody jimmy dennis obviously was pretty insane since the man was in prison for 25 years and he shouldn't have been um, at least here we're celebrating a life that was lived beautifully there. We were talking about life that was stolen. So at least he gets lived now. So to focus here again on Max and, and, and finish strong on what we're talking about, I just want to reiterate and remind every single person here that all of us are perspective points, paintbrushes, creating the meaning, you know, building this beautiful picture that becomes our existence. And all of us are extensions of source, you know, whether you call it God, universe, creator. And we're literally a paintbrush with the opportunity to create. And those of us who don't ever come into our brilliance and don't find that brilliance are doing themselves an injustice. And I look at somebody like Max and one of the things that oftentimes he'd say is he'd say, I don't know if I found that brilliance. And it kind of made me laugh because, you know, he thought, he had to make more money or do something like he was always like, did I do enough? And all he had to do was just turn and look around him and just look at all the people and look at his family. And, and I think sometimes like he knew he was supposed to live and do all these things for his family. But in the back of our minds as humans, we question, are we painting a big enough picture? And what he really needed to look more closely at and he's seeing now is he was painting that picture the whole time. He was wondering if he was painting the picture. And so for anybody here who's trying to figure out what their mission or their purpose or their why is, look at a person like Max. The title didn't matter. The cars didn't matter. The whatever didn't matter. It was the connections, the moments, the beauty, and the fact that you can see Kim, Greg, and Ellen or me saying all these things about him with complete and total conviction and total love for this man and taking on all those parts of him and making this a commencement to the rest of the world we live in and looking forward to joining him and what's beyond, I would personally suggest that might be a good way to live. And I will never tell anybody to follow the path of another, but I would suggest that might be a beautiful option for you. And take those things that we've shared, the parts of Max that will never ever die. If nothing else, they've only been amplified because now they don't only live in Max but they live in everything else. Love you guys. We love you guys.